Turkey, a nation of 77 million people who for most of the last century have lived according to the founding principles of one man, Kemal Ataturk, the father of the Turks. Secularism, nationalism and westernization, all enshrined in a constitution penned in 1923 and unquestioned by the vast majority of the Turkish population. Until now. Times are changing for Turkey, both at home and abroad. With its unmatched geographical location, Turkey is on course to regain its historical influence across the Middle East, while remaining an important ally of the European Union and the United States. Increasingly, Turkish diplomats are being called upon to mediate in seemingly intractable regional disputes, whether between Syria and Israel or Iran and the US. But unity within its own borders remains a pressing issue. And such daunting domestic problems are bedeviling Turkey's progress, including that elusive entry to the European Union. But with a newfound confidence epitomized by its foreign minister, Ahmed Davutoglu, Turkey may finally be ready to take its place as a genuine global power. This narrow strip of water in Istanbul is all that separates Asia from Europe. On that side of the shore is Europe, and on this shore is Asia. That's the reason that Turkey has always been described by the outside world as a bridge between continents, cultures and religions. But there's a new drive under the Turkish foreign minister that wants to see Turkey and reveal Turkey not as a crossroads but as a centre in itself, a centre of power, a centre of influence. Waalaikum salam, Eid Mubarak, Kulam and Tumikhair. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. My wife. Over the past few months, I've had unique access to the architect of Turkey's foreign policy, Ahmed Dao Toglu. Mehmed. Although only in office since May 2009, he has long been considered the power behind the throne, having advised prime ministers and foreign ministers over the previous eight years. During his first year as foreign minister, Davutoglu has sought to build on this influence by promoting Turkey as a truly global power. For 500 years, in spreading this message, he has paid over 100 official foreign visits, lifted visa restrictions on several neighboring countries, and even taken cautious steps towards a normalizing of relations with Armenia following a century of enmity. In doing so, Davutoglu has utilized Turkey's unmatched strategic location for diplomatic gain. What is Turkey? Turkey is part of East, but from the modern perspective also, we are part of Western tradition. So the developments in Turkey is like litmus test of globalization. If we are successful to bring all this together in a dynamic manner, peaceful manner, it will not be only a good example for Turkey or our region, but it will be also a good example and contribution for the global developments in the future. So in the house we have traditional Ottoman art as well as the modern uh, Turkish paintings. You can never get, National you can never identity get has always been Turkey's hottest issue and is still guaranteed to provoke controversy. Kemal Ataturk founded the Republic on the ruins of the Ottoman Empire. Overnight, he abolished a 700-year-old system of government, changed the alphabet and dress code, and looked one way to the West. For him, to modernize was to westernize, and Europe was the ultimate destiny. And all of this was to be imposed on an overwhelmingly Muslim society. For Ataturk, there was no other way. 
and in the intervening decades, to disagree with the ideology of Ataturk was to invite censure or worse. Today, however, many Turks are questioning the very cornerstones of their society and once again daring to ask, who are we? The first day of Eid and this supposedly secular nation comes together in prayer. Surrounded by ordinary members of the public, Ahmed Dao Toglu is joined in Ankara's biggest mosque by President Abdullah Gul. They both hail from the central Turkish region of Anatolia, and it is suggested that the more conservative and Islamic traditions of the area have informed their politics. Along with the Prime Minister, the trio are the highest ranking officials in the country and the primary policy architects of the Justice and Development Party, or the AKP. The AKP is currently the single largest party in Parliament and has won the last two elections, increasing its share in the last vote in 2007. On coming to power five years previously, it was suggested that the party would pursue an Islamist agenda, reject Turkey's decades-long flirtation with the West and especially its near obsession with European Union membership. In fact, eight years on, relations with the West remain strong, while to the East, bonds have also been strengthened. It is this development that worries the opposition in Turkey. I went to meet one of the most vocal members of parliament who claims that the ruling party has not shared its Islamist past and is in fact transforming the country along religious lines in order to bolster its standing in the Muslim world. Turkey represents in this part of the world Western values like democracy, like human rights, like secularism, gender equality and so on and so forth. Turkey should be and can be a springboard of Western democracies in this region, which will bring peace and stability. According to Oyman, this goes against the foundations of modern Turkey and its adopted role. That's right. When you present yourself as a member of a non-Western civilization, then it creates a problem because in the, since the foundation of our republic, Turkey considers herself always as a part and parcel of Western civilization. You see, so it's a departure uh, from uh, our uh, traditional values and it may uh, make a shift in the center of gravity of Turkish foreign policy. To honor Oyman, the foreign relations spokesperson of the main opposition Republican Nationalist Party, the government's courting of Middle Eastern regimes amounts to little more than political posturing and risks damaging relations with the West. I believe that uh, actually the policies followed by the government, although they have a lot of ambitions, uh, unless they have concrete positive results, uh, which would be beneficial for Turkey and for the countries of the region, we should have reasons to be uh, a little doubtful about uh, the ways they are conducting this policy. But for Dao Toglu, there is no contradiction. When I speak in Cairo or in Tehran or in Jeddah, I speak as, a, as somebody from the region, as a Muslim, and that I have that right. And when I speak in Brussels, I speak as a European. When I speak with European friends, I can criticize, as Europeans, what is failing in Europe. And it is not against my identity as a Muslim. 
There, I have full right to speak as a European because we are part of European history. We are part of this continent. Whatever happens here is our destiny. Turkey's premier diplomat is on a mission, seeking to define a foreign policy which maintains historic relations with Western allies, while emphasizing Turkey's Islamic credentials to Middle Eastern partners. When he is not traveling, the day starts early for Ahmed Dao Toglu and his assistants, with a briefing on global and domestic issues. <laughs> But these discussions tend to be dominated by planning a foreign policy that emphasizes the importance of re-engaging with territories once controlled by the Ottoman Empire. In the last year alone, Turkish diplomats have claimed credit for mediating between Israel and Syria, Afghanistan and Pakistan, Sunnis and Shias in Iraq, and even attempting to negotiate over the most vexing crisis of our time, the Iranian nuclear issue. And ironically, Turkey's rapprochement with the Middle East wow. may bring a peace dividend yeah. to the West in the long term. For Dao Toglu, this dual-edged approach borders upon an obsession. You can speak. Even at a dinner at home, surrounded by friends and family, foreign policy is on Dao Toglu's mind. Why would they turn to you, though? Why, why to Turkey? I mean, why do you think that, it, take the example of Palestine and Israel or Iran, what, what do they have to gain? They realize that Turkey has an ethical position, consistent, and we have a vision for our region. I mean, there are some policies, uh, foreign policy approach, from crisis to vision. You concentrate on crisis, and you try to deal with the crisis. Our policy is, no, we focus on vision, then from that vision we are trying to solve the crisis. And that vision is good for all the region. Dao Toglu is Turkey's most traveled diplomat. With around 20 foreign visits a month, it was fitting to meet him on his way to a conference of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Assalamu alaikum, Minister, how are you? Thank you, how are you? Very well, thank you for taking me on the journey to Greece. Turkey's geographic location makes it a key partner in any discussion of the continent's security. And yet, it is its very location at the periphery of Europe that has made the EU reluctant to grant membership. In 1963, we signed an agreement, association agreement with the uh, European Union. From that time until now, Unfortunately, we have been waiting, but after 1999, we have been very active to fulfill the Cop uh, what we call Copenhagen criteria, the basic political criteria. Ironically, though, I mean, in your first yet to the frustration of Dao Toglu and his colleagues, the EU still seems reluctant to accept Turkey as one of its own. The speed and scope of Turkey's diplomatic endeavors outside Europe have bewildered many, leading to questions about its leadership's commitment to EU integration. This shows the balance to Brussels, to Syria. They are trying to make this as a case, as if uh, we, Turkey prefers to unite with neighbors rather than EU. But uh, this is not valid because we are doing this policy, implementing these policies together. We didn't ignore the European Union uh, process when we are focusing on this neighboring country's po policy. Entry to the EU has been the current government's stated aim. However, European leaders such as French President Nicolas Sarkozy has consistently opposed such a move contending that he cannot tell French students that Europe's borders lie along Syria and Iraq, and he is not alone in his opposition. Germany is one of the most important European allies for Turkey. Millions of Turks live in Germany, and in return, Germany is one of the largest European investors in Turkey. So you would have thought that Berlin would be pushing actively for full EU membership for Turkey. But as this visit to Turkey by Angela Merkel shows, these two key allies are wide apart on a number of fundamental issues. 
Turkey's neighbours to the east and the south were its biggest headache in gaining EU approval. During the last decade, a military confrontation was just averted with Syria, and a war was waged on the Iraqi border with Kurdish fighters. The zero problem with neighbours policy has recently turned Iraq and Syria into allies. Now, through Turkish-Syrian relations, we are reinventing history. It is not neo-Ottomanism, it is normalization of history. But it is Turkey's relationship with Armenia that remains the most troubling. Their border continues to be closed, a stark reminder of the mutual hostility that has existed for the last century. Yet, in a landmark achievement, protocols were signed in October 2009 to normalize relations and to reopen borders. These protocols were intended to put to rest once and for all the claims by Armenians that Ottoman Turks committed genocide against them during the First World War when the Armenians sided with Ottoman Turkey's enemy, Russia. But this initial optimism has been short-lived, with the agreement remaining unratified by the parliaments of both countries. Even so, the desire to address an issue that for so long has been a taboo perhaps reflects a mood change not only within Turkish official circles, but among the Turkish public itself. In January 2007, the Turkish public was introduced to Harad Dink, a prominent Armenian Turkish journalist. Prosecuted three times for denigrating Turkishness, he was shot dead outside his office. At his funeral, over 100,000 mourners marched in protest of the assassination, chanting, we are all Armenians. But subsequently, progress has been slow. This is the pavement where Haran Dink was murdered, allegedly by an ultra-nationalist. And yet today, there isn't a single plaque commemorating that assassination. I've come to visit the place where he worked and the newspaper he edited to see what, if anything, has changed for Armenians in Turkey since that tragic event. Pakrat Estukyan is the editor of the paper and has worked closely with Hrat Dink. When Agos newspaper was founded in 1996, one of its goals was to contribute to the normalization of relations between Turkey and Armenia. Hrant Dink defeated his enemies because they were desperate people. They were already doomed to lose. His murderers were misguided kids. Even if the murder hadn't taken place, Hrant Dink killers would have been defeated. We could say that hope is born. It would be also right to say that Armenians are sympathetic towards Davutoglu, or in the larger sense, Turkey's foreign policy in recent years. In other words, Armenians are sympathetic with the mentality of zero problem policy with your neighbors. Many Armenians have lived for centuries in Turkey, and they would be affected by the government's rapprochement with their country of origin. I head to a region that symbolizes Turkey's complex history and the contradictory nature of borders in the Middle East. The Turkish region of Hatay is claimed by Syria, which calls it Alexandretta. Its inhabitants speak Arabic as well as Turkish, mostly of a minority that is also found in northern Syria. There are also Kurds and Armenians, very few Armenians. The village of Vakfli is what the guidebooks describe as the last remaining Armenian village in Turkey, where less than 200 people have stayed behind. And they feel that positive change is finally happening. It's the best. 
It's better now. It's better now. Ten years ago, 30 years ago, it wasn't as good as it is now. This government of Erdogan is good because they are saying that Armenians have rights, Turks have rights, Arabs have rights. They say we should all be like brothers. Perhaps, understandably, this tiny minority is not interested in dredging up the past. Maybe even today, being an Armenian in Turkey can be a precarious existence. Whatever happened, happened. We don't suffer anymore from it. That was history. I cannot say anything else. Historians know history more than me. I don't know about this issue. Sorry, but uh, we are very comfortable here. Can't talk anymore. But the whole Armenian opening is in jeopardy now. In March 2010, the American House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee passed the non-binding resolution that the killing of Armenians during the Ottoman Empire was genocide. Uh, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. Turkey recoiled in anger and recalled its ambassador in Washington, but stopped short of abandoning the process of rapprochement. And Dao Toglu insists that overall, things have improved. Some people analyze the processes. Some analyze only pictures. Today is 13th March 2010. You can have a picture you can say there's a problem here. But if you do not have several pictures in your mind, like the situation 13th March in 2009, 2008, 2007, you cannot say that there is a progress or not progress. So it's not the end of the story? No, that's what I mean. For Dao Toglu, foreign intervention is not welcomed. If this is an issue, it is an issue between Turkey and uh, Armenia between Turks and Armenians. We are ready as Turks, we are self-confident. We are ready to discuss everything regarding to our history. Because 1915, they should not forget that for Turkish nation, it was also a year of Gallipoli. Who came to our lands to occupy? What did they do? This, this is a long story. But we understand the pains of uh, uh, the tragedies of Armenians as well. But they should understand our tragedy. But we will never allow either American or Swedish or any other nation to judge on our history. This is the most important festival of the year for Turkey's largest minority, who comprise around 20% of the total population. symbolizes the arrival of spring and the passing of the dark season of winter. But a ban on its celebration was only lifted just over a decade ago because these festivities do not celebrate all things Turkish, but all things Kurdish. passing year, the celebrations have become more intense, more politicized, and increasingly symbolic of Kurdish demands for equality. Yet today, despite the government's best efforts, the Kurdish issue remains its most intractable one. When we look at domestic law, we see that it's based on denying all different identities of different cultures. It means there is no identity here other than the Turks. Everyone is a Turk. Everyone should be a Turk. If you fancy yourself as someone other than a Turk, then your party is closed down, you're put in prison and become the target of this state.
The Republican ideology governing Turkey between 1922 and 2002 saw Kurds as the only minority that could pose a threat to Turkish national unity and identity. An active Kurdish separatist movement began in southeastern Turkey in 1984, but it was ruthlessly suppressed and its leader, Abdullah Öcalan, imprisoned. And now, just as many Turks are asking, who are we? So Kurds are asking, where are we going? As the conflict shows no sign of ending. <laughs> but Ahmed Turk is not going anywhere. A former chairman of the leading Kurdish political party and a former member of the Turkish parliament, he and his associates were recently banned from politics for five years. Their party closed, its representatives expelled from parliament. Their crime? Alleged links with Kurdish separatist rebels. Sharing the stage with Ahmed Turk is an electric experience, and there is no doubting the fervor of the half million Kurds gathered before him. When the Republic was found, Mustafa Kemal sent letters to the Kurdish tribes, sheikhs, gave speeches in the parliament, emphasizing Kurds are our brothers. We are equals. Kurds will express themselves, but after a while, he tried to erase the Kurds from history and banned the word Kurdish. And now we have this. For this reason, Kurds are extremely confused. I am confused too. On one hand, I say I have to support the AKP against the current system. But on the other hand, I'm not sure if AKP is serious and ready to take steps on his issue. Although I'm not sure, I cannot put my people into that risk. It wasn't just promises being broken. Memories of ill treatment at the hands of Turkish authorities are still fresh. When some members of Osman Akdag's Kurdish family were tortured and killed, others joined the struggle. Not forgetting the torture her brother went through, my daughter also joined the guerrillas. On my son's first battle against the Turkish army, he fell as a martyr. The other two sisters also became martyrs. The other person is my nephew. He lived with me. He was brought up with me, the one I loved more than my son. He has gone missing, and till now, we do not know where he is. Every morning when we get up, their photographs are in front of our eyes. As we wake up, it is as if they say from their photos, Good morning, what are you doing, Dad? Are you forgetting us? That is why we stay loyal to their struggle. Thousands of families across the country have been as deeply affected as the Akdags. Around 40,000 were killed as a result of this conflict, a point not ignored by the AK party, who admits mistakes were often committed in the past. Even the army, which has historically refused to countenance any expressions of cultural rights for Kurds, have now asserted that military means alone cannot solve the Kurdish problem. But engaging with alienated Kurds will not be easy. We wanted to be like in other countries in Europe, that everyone could freely express themselves in their own identity, to be able to read and write in their own language, to be able to get an education in their own language. There must be clear statement on the identity card saying that one is a Kurd. <laughs> Hey, 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 hey,
The Turkish AKP government's aim of zero problems abroad and peace at home will be tested to its limits by the Kurdish issue. It compromises the perception of Turkey as an international peacemaker while placing a huge burden on the taxpayer in the shape of military expenditure. The current Turkish government tried to change the status quo and the long-standing Kurdish problem by solving it peacefully. It even spoke of a roadmap. But for the goodwill announced, critics argued that no clear steps were taken by the government, and when it did, they were the wrong ones. At the moment they stop fighting, then the, the state can be very indulgent. But at this moment, apparently the government starts a, a sort of an, a indirect dialogue with terrorism, being terrorists, before they accept uh, leaving their arms. And they state on several occasions, the terrorists have stated on several occasions that they will never give up their arms. So this is the problem. Yet the AK party's stated policy of negotiation with so-called terror groups has drawn support from many battle-weary Kurdish voters. But this goodwill cannot last forever, and it seems that the AKP party will live or die by its policies towards the Kurds. If this state still sees itself as the republic of imminent elites, and if the imminent elites and the military custodians see themselves as the owners of this country, you cannot achieve democracy here or create a strong Turkey in the Middle East or the world without changing all those, without guaranteeing Kurdish rights. Despite ongoing skepticism from the European Union, it seems that the biggest obstacle to Turkey becoming a true global power may, after all, be itself. Even by the standards of those countries whose armies have long been involved in areas such as politics, the role of the army in Turkey has gone far beyond that. Because the army traditionally has not only seen itself as being there to guarantee Turkey's security, it's also seen itself as an expression of what it means to be Turkish. Turks' respect for their armed forces runs very deep. They are proud of their soldiers' courage and their value internationally as peacekeepers and NATO allies. They are viewed as the most revered institution of the Republic. This is no accident, given that Ataturk's military career had allowed him to form the Republic with the army's backing. The top generals propagate an image as fathers of the nation, high above the fray of party politics and dedicated only to the good of the country. And they represented everything associated with Turkishness, with being a Turk, with being a member of this country, associated with, with the past, with the history, with the, with the identity of the Turkish nation, with, with the existence of the country and the nation, and also associated with, with, the, with the future of this country. You saw it as the heart and soul of this country? Absolutely. But there are many changes sweeping Turkey, from questions of identity to direction of foreign policy to the public view of the army. The army has staged three coups since 1960, when it hanged the country's first freely elected prime minister. It also established the National Security Council and set up its own courts. To many, they created a parallel state. 
After the 1980 coup, they even pushed through an authoritarian constitution that remains in force today. Its justification? Protecting the secular legacy of Turkey's founder, Atatürk. This time, however, it wasn't successful. The government was too strong, too popular. And in the last year, over 70 officers have been arrested in connection with coup conspiracies against the current elected government. And whatever the result of court proceedings, the allegations are prompting a debate about the role the army should play in society, and, more importantly, about who runs Turkey. The army, while it had the opportunity, the time and the ability, capability, to promote democracy, real democracy in Turkey, not only secularism, but other dimensions, such as you know, freedom of speech, you know, uh, freedom of, of, of media, primacy of law, you know, fighting corruption, etc. They turned a deaf ear and blind eye to, to these you know, vital dimensions of democracy. Now, in a and sense... And that has handicapped the army now. Not... <laughs> Honestly, not only the army, this, this handicapped the whole country. But Turkey is in flux, and the army's reduced ability to wield influence is perhaps an indication of this. In many parts of the Middle East, national armies openly control every facet of public life. This has forced Islamist political groups that were suppressed to become clandestine and plot takeovers in secret. In Turkey, it's exactly the opposite. The popularity of political parties with Islamist backgrounds and the increasing democratization of Turkey has driven the army underground. And now, when the army objects to the government's policies, it has no option but to rely on the constitutional court rather than an unconstitutional coup. In 2008, the military attempted to ban the AK party, alleging that it sought to reverse secular rule in Turkey. The army's petition failed, though only by a whisker. The constitutional court in the building behind me has intervened in over a dozen cases to ban politicians and political parties, including the AK party itself. But now, the AK party is fighting back against the constitutional court. What it's trying to do is to reform the court itself and its influence. Recently, the government announced a constitutional reform package that would curb the powers of its most persistent opponents in the judiciary and the military. Both, says the AKP, have depended on each other to weaken civilian elected governments. The main proposals include transferring power from military and constitutional courts to parliament. Critics of the government suspect its principal aim is to neutralize opponents. It's not the government's need, it's the society's need, because the 1982 constitution is not made by the society, but by the military coup. And now we are designing a constitution based on freedoms like in developed countries. We wanted to change the whole thing, but could not get approval. So now we are trying to make the necessary amendments. Those amendments were passed recently in Parliament, but fell short of a two-thirds majority, so they will still have to go to a referendum. Still, the opposition will challenge the reforms in the Constitutional Court, one of the institutions which would be most affected. If, at the end, the government is successful, it will be one of the biggest changes in Turkey's political landscape. But Turkey is also changing economically. It has become the sixth largest economy in Europe and the 17th biggest in the world. Once again, this transformation has involved the dismantling of one of the central pillars of Ataturk's republic, nationalization. Under the AK party, the country embarked on a liberalization drive that aimed to roll back the substantial Turkish state. 
It also oversaw several big ticket privatizations, which brought record foreign investment to Turkey. Hundreds of kilometers from the political hot houses of Ankara and Istanbul, Turkey's economic powerhouse is taking shape. And if you want to see the so-called Anatolian Tigers in action, this is the place to head for. Kayseri, behind me, is a picturesque town of the foothills of the snow-capped mountains of central Anatolia. But that's not why I've come here. The reason why I've traveled to this region is because of this vast area, the industrial zone on the edge of Kayseri. Because what's happening there is being seen as part of the economic engine of change that is transforming Turkey. Boydak Holding is an example of the recent growth of the private sector in Turkey during the last decade. Its best-known company, Istikbal Furniture, continues to open branches through the Middle East. And it is Middle Eastern money that has partly set up another Boydak venture, Turkey Finance Bank. Their support is their <clears throat> opening the ways, like free trade uh, agreements. With the different like dip diplomacy. Yeah, yeah with, with diplomacy. Because uh, uh, in the past, uh, for example, uh, especially in our neighborhood, Turkey was a closed economy and we, didn't, we did not used to have too much relations uh, with our neighbor, uh, uh, neighbors like Syria, like Greece, you know, uh, Iran, Iraq. And now over 35% uh, of the exports are to neighboring countries. If trade with Turkey's neighbors is an indication of its changing diplomatic orientation, then the results are very clear. Trade with the Middle East increased by 12% over the last three years, the same percentage as its trade fell with the EU. And while the EU procrastinates over welcoming Turkey into its club, other neighbors are much more welcoming. Yet Turkey's increasingly close economic and political ties with its Arab partners has not prevented it, controversially, from retaining links with Israel, at least from an economic perspective. Trade levels between the two countries have remained fairly constant throughout the AK party's tenure. Further evidence that Turkey's economic policy closely mirrors its foreign policy. More than 80 years ago, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk founded the modern Turkish Republic, redefining the lives of its people for generations. <laughs> Eight years ago, a new political party came to power and they began a program of profound change that might ultimately prove to be as influential as those orchestrated by the nation's founder. With America's grip on the Middle East beginning to loosen, a newly confident Turkey is finally attempting to harness its regional power on a truly international scale, despite the problems at home that refuse to go away. What is our objective? Zero problem with our neighbors. I know that this is a slogan, but slogans are symbols as well. Symbols creates a new mind. The most important is to change the, the concepts in the mind of the people. You can create enemies through concepts. You can create friends through, through concepts. Now with these symbols, we showed our good intention. And with our actions based on these symbols, we achieved a big, a big success with our neighbors. <laughs>